right. I would like to welcome everybody to this uh, first session for our 2022-23 season. And again, we have some important people from our own society doing the presentation with uh, a project that's been going on now for several years that initially started, Paul Pangaro started, but now there's a whole group of dedicated people who have been working effectively and collaboratively. And I'm really happy to be able to <laughs> invite them to begin the, their session as they will have far more to say about it than I will. At the end, I'll just to clarify what's coming next, but in case people have to leave early, I'll say that our next meeting will be on October 23rd, not the regular time due to there being a conflict with the conference. Carry on. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. And let me also uh, introduce Kate Doyle, who is a co-lead in our New Macy endeavors here. Thank you very much, Pile, for the invitation to join the speaker series here with ASC. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, hello, Kate. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. So, so, yeah, go. I'll talk about our plan for today, which is always subject to improvisation and improvement. Uh, we want to introduce New Macy by briefly describing our intentions, situating it in history, and enacting a few performance pieces, including one during which we'll invite your collaboration. This will be roughly an hour, after which we will invite your poetic responses via your, via interactive board over conversation. Paul? So, yeah, um, as Pile said, the initiative started as, as a recognition in March of 2020. We all remember that month, I think. Uh, the COVID was about to change everyone's world. I think we all had that instinct at the time. But also COVID itself was only a single instance of many, many deeply troubling and global wicked challenges that had all changed our world, even though we might not have noticed it the way COVID came with a kind of slam. And all these other things uh, we were taking too little notice of, at least in the opinion of those who began with me in New Macy. So overlaid or maybe underlying the biological global pandemic of COVID-19, which is now COVID-20, 21, 22, and so on. There were other pandemics uh, that were growing in our consciousness, you know, racism and inequality, economic insecurity, population pressure, climate change, species eradication. It's, it's overwhelming. And feeling strongly amongst the group that I began uh, gathering together, and many of whom have joined, and as Pile says, is now a movement of its own, I dare say, that cybernetics specifically uh, could help here. How could it help, I suppose, was the question posed. So as we know, those in the field know and those out of the field ought to know that it began cybernetics as a transdisciplinary idea, that it was not a siloed way of thinking, but rather uh, one way of thinking among many possible ways of thinking with a nod to a weak <laughs> paraphrase of Larry Richards. But we all felt that cybernetics had a way of offering language and framing of, of the challenges or approaching the challenges that the concepts and the models and the history of cybernetics might have something to offer in this dense world of wicked challenges of so many kinds. And it was also immediately clear that in that history of cybernetics, there were a series of meetings called the Macy meetings or the Macy conferences named after the nonprofit funding agency called the Josiah Macy Foundation. These from the 1940s and 1950s, they marked milestones in the contribution of cybernetics to the world of its time. And so it seemed natural to revive and renew those intentions of the original Macy meetings to make a contribution to the modern world. So clearly transdisciplinary, that's a no brainer now. Uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, that was a new thing. But also we needed to be more global and inclusive than that. So trans-global, inclusive in that broad sense that we now embrace today, but also oh, transgenerational. Yes. But also transgenerational because it's those newest generations, certainly later than my generation, that will be inheriting these global wicked challenges. And indeed, it'll be their responsibility, the responsibility of later generations, 
to embrace the needs to approach and change and to make the world a different place in order to overcome these. Anyway, you, you get the idea that that's a little more convoluted. I think it's a straight line between transdisciplinary, transgenerational, and transglobal is necessary in New Macy. And that was the organizing principle of New Macy. And since then, there have been many meetings. We'll paste something in the chat for you in a moment if you're not familiar with some of the documentation. But this was the, the origin story, if you will, of New Macy out of COVID, but out of an awareness of all of these large issues. And since then, as will be explained in the course of this next uh, session, we've expanded to a number of different themes and, and there's energy now and momentum on those individual themes. Okay. So by way of introducing New Macy and the old Macy meetings, our colleagues will use an excerpt of a conversation among three historical characters recorded in 1976. The first speaker will be Mac Giancola as Stuart Brand, followed by Larry Richards as Gregory Bateson, then Eve Pinsker as Margaret Mead. Okay. I need a little background, if it's all right, on how this whole Macy thing got rolling, why and when, and, and what the sequence was. There was this Macy meeting uh, in, in what, 42? Who, who, sorry, who started it and, and what was it about? This was a meeting called Cerebral Inhibition. Uh, which in fact was a meeting on hypnosis. Most of what was said about feedback was said over lunch. Well, I know that's what you always tell people, but I didn't sit in the same place at lunch and I heard what was said at that conference. But at that conference, which is the one where Milton Erickson hypnotized that Yale psychologist, it was at the end of that conference that you really had the design of what needed to be done. And then you were caught up in war work and went overseas. Now, when was the Rosenbluth, Wiener, and Bigelow paper, the first great paper on cybernetics? A behavior, purpose, and teleology in the philosophy of science in 1943. It could just have been coming out at the time of the Cerebral Inhibition Conference. It reported on the formal character of seeking mechanisms, essentially, self-corrective mechanisms such as missiles, the missile measures the angle between its direction and the target it's seeking and uses that measure to correct itself. Do you recall what they were saying that you overheard that got you excited? It was a solution to the problem of purpose. From Aristotle on, the final cause has always been the mystery. This came out then. We didn't realize it then, that the whole of logic would have to be reconstructed for recursiveness. When I came in from overseas in 45, I went uh, within the first two or three days to Frank Fremont Smith and said, let's have a Macy conference on that stuff. Fremont Smith told me, uh, yes, we've just arranged to have one. McCulloch is the chairman. Go talk to McCulloch. And McCulloch had a grand design in his mind. He got people into that conference who he then kept from talking. Yes, uh, he had a design on how the shape of the conversation could run over five years. What had to be said before what else had to be said? He wouldn't let Ralph Gerard talk. He said, you can talk next year. He was very autocratic. Yes, uh, but an awfully good chairman in many ways. It's uh, very rare to have a chairman who knows what it's all about. What was his grand design? Who knows? Well, I think more or less what happened was. How did the first meeting differ from, from the second meeting? There wasn't even any usable terminology. At first, we called the thing feedback, and the models that we were presented with at that point were the guided missile, target seeking. They were talking almost entirely of negative feedback. By this time, Wiener and Bigelow and Johnny von Neumann, of course, were members of the group. There were three groups of people. There were the mathematicians and the physicists, people trained in the physical sciences who were very, very precise in what they wanted to think about. 
there was a small group of us, anthropologists and psychiatrists, who were trained to know enough about psychology and groups so we knew what was happening and could use it and disallow it. And then there were two or three gossips in the middle who were very simple people who had a lot of loose intuition and no discipline as to what they were doing. In a sense, it was the most interesting conference I've ever been in because nobody knew how to manage these things yet. So you had one group of people that was to another group on a level they were not used to. Yes, and shifting back and forth between these levels and keeping everything straight was very interesting. Margaret, what was your perception at the time of the, of the early Macy meetings as to what was going on? The thing that cybernetics made the most difference to me in, in the social organization field was the interaction between the mother and child. There had been too much emphasis that there were temperamental differences among children so that you responded differently to a hyperactive baby than you did to a quiet baby. But the extent to which there was a system in which the mother was dependent on what the child had learned as the stimulus for the next position wasn't well articulated until we got the cybernetics conferences going. The link up between the behavioral sciences spread very slowly and it hasn't really spread yet. The cyberneticians in the narrow sense of the word went off into input output. They went off into computer science. Yeah, if you have that diagram, uh, the computer science is input output. You got a box and you got this line closing the box. And the science is a science of these boxes. Now, the essence of Wiener cybernetics was that the science is the science of the whole circuit. The diagram uh, at the bottom. You see in the diagram, an event here is reported by a sense organ of some type and affects something then you say there's an input and an output, as in the top diagram. When you work on the box, uh, th then you work on, on the box. Uh, what Wiener says is that you work on the whole picture and its properties. Now there may be boxes inside here, uh, like this of all sorts, but essentially your ecosystem, your organism plus environment is to be considered as a single circuit. And you're not really concerned with an input output but with the events within the bigger circuit, and you are part of the bigger circuit. And these lines around the box, which are just conceptual lines after all, which mark the difference between the engineers and- And between the, engineer, between the systems people and general systems theory too. Yes. A kind of Martin Buber-ish breakdown, I it, where they're trying to keep themselves out of that which they're studying. The, the engineer is outside the box and Wiener is inside the box. I'm inside the box. You see, Wiener named the thing, and of course the word cybernetics comes from the Greek word for helmsman. It actually existed as a word before Wiener. It's a 19th century word. Yes, but he wrote the book Cybernetics and sort of patented the, that idea. And then he went to Russia and was very well received. So cybernetics spread all over the Soviet Union very rapidly and in Czechoslovakia, whereas what spread here was systems theory instead of cybernetics. How did that happen? It seems like something went kind of awry. Americans like mechanical machines. So we just heard the roots of the original Macy meetings. And now in the era of the new Macy, we move even further beyond thinking about mechanical machines. One way we shape systems is through the stories we tell ourselves about those systems. Stories orient us. They reveal or conceal possible action and movement. Stories are ontological machines. They make sense. A story situates us somewhere. It puts us in a beginning, a middle, or an end. And when we find our place within this story system, we have a sense that the story will persist and the next story will come. But today's most unsettling events are interrupting these stories. Beyond the pandemic, we see a plague of natural disasters at unnatural scales. We see political radicalization severing us from people we love. The stability of institutions is being upturned. And if all life is a stage, it may feel like the painted backdrop is falling down. 
that the stories we tell ourselves are breaking. In our discussions as the new Macy group, we've, we've come to start talking about Anthony Giddens and this description of narrative of selfhood that he put together as the uh, through the uh, lens of ontological security. For him, the stories that form our identity are reinforced by a stable connection and orientation to the world. But when snow stops falling in March or when fog stops rolling over the Golden Gate Bridge, we start losing this orientation. The world is going to continue to move and we began to think about how we might address this problem through a cybernetic approach. So we set ourselves up with a challenge to foster communities and identities oriented not towards stories of being, but stories of becoming. And we've taken to calling this ontogenetic resilience. Ontogenetic resilience means sustainably preserving a state of becoming, to see emergence and growth as a source of stability. This is in contrast to the security we seek through stories of what we have already been, Many of the problems we face today benefit from giving up on a search for quote unquote solutions that turn clocks backward or restore a never existing past. Instead of reversals, we're proposing navigation, steering. The question moves from how do we solve and becomes how do we steer ourselves through states of resistance, refusal, acceptance, withdrawal, or rest. And today's events is a way of setting off to sea. I'm going to read a poem written by Laura Gilpin, published in 1977, The Two-Headed Calf. Tomorrow, when the farm boys find this freak of nature, they will wrap his body in newspaper and carry him to the museum. But tonight he is alive and in the north field with his mother. It is a perfect summer evening, the moon rising over the orchard, the wind in the grass. And as, as he stares into the sky, there are twice as many stars as usual. Cybernetics is at its core poetic. Cybernetics fosters intersubjectivities, it acts to integrate. Life is the model for cybernetics, not vice versa. And thus within the process of making as poesis, we may well integrate a paradox. Like all art that takes life seriously, cybernetics is concerned with agency. And in relation to this, there is a deep concern for both the openness and resonance of form. Cybernetics cares for the fluidity of systems and as it does care, it acts to balance or undo all actions that aim to dominate or to create fixed hierarchies. Those which would require an enforcement from outside the system. Cybernetics as poesis cultivates the future as open. Onto genetic resilience is the behavior of cybernetics as poesis. A metalogue is a form of conversation created by Gregory Bateson and developed by Mary Catherine Bateson, in which the process and structure of the conversation as a whole parallels the subject. We will use a metalogue to introduce the new Macy Studios that will occur throughout the fall and spring of this year and the next. Bateson famously used the figure of his then daughter, Mary Catherine, as his partner in these metalogues, a casting that allowed for the retainment of childhood wonderment and parental affection in conversation. Here, we reimagine this relationship as one of mother-son. Mama, what is a studio? A studio is an event during which ideas emerge through action. 
It draws its concept from the studio space where people hold conversations with the self and others through a variety of forms and materials. What does the studio space look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? Well, it can be big or small. It can hold paintings, easels, video cameras, and musical instruments. It can smell like turpentine or wood or metal. It can sound very quiet or sound like violins coming into tune. And it can be a public or a private space. Hmm. When is it public and when is it private and who decides? Good. The question of privacy in the studio is an interesting one. Studios are spaces where people devise and construct ideas, where they create. Sometimes people want the first or subsequent versions of their creation to be private. Hmm. Like when I'm writing a poem or composing a song in my room, I don't want anyone to hear it just quite yet, so I keep the door closed. Yes, like that. But actually, wouldn't it be interesting if people could come in and see the whole thing that I was write, writing or composing the song and the poem or song before I finish it in the act of producing it? Also, yes. And this is why the studio is a very intriguing space. It is where one can witness process. Process? Yes, process, where things and ideas are becoming. Hmm. So by witnessing, can you become part of the process and participate in bringing it about? Do people sneak into studios to become part of things? Well, the studio owners began to invite them in. Sometimes these became events called salons and occurred in people's homes. Sometimes studios were held in public spaces like taverns or coffee shops. They can happen anywhere. Hmm. It might be uncomfortable for other people to see my process as I'm working on something. I'm kind of erratic. But then maybe I might learn something about my own making and learning. And wait, aren't we doing this very thing now by my sneaking into your studio while you're preparing for the studio today? Yes, and that's the fun of it. We might think of making processes public as prototyping sharing our experimentation, exploration, and play with ideas and the forms that they take. You found me trying to work out how I would explain what a studio is. I did by prototyping my explanation with you. I think it could use some more work. You do? What kind of work? Well, you've used words, but it might also be something that you can do with pictures or maybe some sound, some music or something Something else I'm not even thinking of yet that uses other senses. What you're considering now is what many of these studios will address, how we exchange ideas in conversation, the possibilities for expression, and the ways in which information is shared and transformed among humans, animals, plants, and machines. And create new prototypes. Exactly. So that our conversation is always expanding. I think I'd like to go to a studio. Good. Let me expand our conversation to include another person so that you can learn more about that. What person? Paul. Paul, would Hi, you Paul. tell us all about the new Macy Studios happening this year? Uh, with pleasure. Thank you for the metalogue. It's beautiful to hear. So let me share a screen quickly and give a little taste of what we've done before at a prior conference at the IISSS not long ago and what we'll be doing at RSD 11 coming up in October in Brighton, but also online. It'll be a fully hybrid conference. So we invite all of you to join that conference. And specifically, if you're interested in the new Macy aspects of it, get in touch with one of us, myself or Kate. You'll hear the uh, emails later in the call today and um, we can help you uh, join at least the RSD 11 New Macy Studios pieces. So as you've been hearing in history, the evolution of New Macy has been for my feelings uh, really quite extraordinary. And we've devoted a lot of work into moving from the abstraction of ideas and a way of doing an act one, act two, act three situation. Um, I'm, I'm not, not meaning for you to read this. Let me switch to a better frame. Um, 
that's a general introduction to the new Macy Studios, uh, which I can put in the chat quickly. And we'll be repeating these eventually. But the point is an individual studio, as you've just heard in the prior sessions, the prior segments, um, has a more directed theme. So it might be about, for example, prototyping conversation, as you see here with Kate and Damian Chapman and TJ McLeish. And each one of these continues through to a deeper description and will give you a very good sense of what will actually occur at RSD 11 coming up in October. And we invite you to join. Uh, there are six studios at the moment, but we do invite more. Uh, we sometimes refer to this as uh, plate spinners, people who have their own plates that they want to keep rolling in the context of the new Macy situation, the new Macy banner, if you will. Um, my particular interest is the pandemic of today's AI. It's a way of characterizing the bad side of the pervasive AI that we have today and the problems that it's created. Um, here are others you've heard already from Eric and Claudia earlier and the beautiful uh, ontogenetic resilience um, uh, introduction. Uh, that's a session that they're doing on cybernetic forms. Here's one on panarchy with Mac and Pile, artist steersmanship, and so on. So each one of these dives into more detail, still to emerge, still improvisationally being expanded. And we invite you to come in October. But the main thing to, I think, carry away now is um, to realize, as has been emphasized, this is emergent, it's ever growing, it's ever a process of learning, as one of the chat mentions just said. And we wanted to expand out. One of the issues we've been dealing with is, however, issues of hierarchy and non-hierarchy. And it's very much our goal not to say, we offer uh, solutions to you, this is the wrong terminology nor do we wanna say, come to us. Rather, we want to come to you, come to others, come to situations that others have identified and that they wish to work within. So the question became, as we develop themes and principles and now studios, how do we offer this to the world in a way that is inclusive and co-creative rather than any sense of hierarchy or we have some uh, secrets of some kind. Uh, we're interested in questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kate to describe where we go from here. Sorry. Thanks, Paul. Uh, as we've developed the new Macy Studios, as Paul mentioned, we're exploring ways that new Macy can look outward to participate with other communities who are navigating wicked challenges. The development of the new Macy Studios has excited us to expand ways of collaborating through improvisation, prototyping, play, and experimentation. We choose to practice ontogenetic resilience as the foundation of our commitment to staying aware of the need to embrace change and to evolve means of addressing the wicked challenges of the planet. So our adaptable goal is to act in generative anticipation of new Macy's possibilities for service in our current moment. The following exercise takes its inspiration from a site of improvisatory collaboration, a place where service is ideally provided for those who seek it. This is the site of the call room, perhaps familiar to you as a site of frustration, where your questions go perpetually unanswered. Your questions will not be answered here either but you will hopefully be guided in working with them in order to adapt to changing environments and the unknowable and to build collaborative relationships as you steer. We call it 1-800-CYBERNET. Because of our time limitations today, we're going to model this exercise. It's normally more widely participatory. For example, at the RSD Symposium in the UK in October that Paul mentioned, we'll have a longer session with collaboration among all those participating. But today we're going to keep the callers and call agents speaking to our group. We would, however, like for you to add your questions and responses in the chat if and as you desire. Paul, ring, ring, ring. Hello. 1-800-CYBERNET, ask a question, leave with three. Please be aware your call may be monitored for ontogenetic resilience. Hi, 
Okay. Um, good morning. My name's Mac Giancola. I'm calling from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I have a question for uh, one eight hundred Cybernet. Okay. Please go ahead. Um, first, please allow me to frame my question. I've posted a few links into the chat. It is uh, quite a complex problem we're facing here. It's um, and I'd like to frame it with a specific example. I'd like to use our current, my current situation, our current situation, where people are forced from land due to climate migration, forced from that same land that helps sustain life and food and water for, for humans. And if you'll allow me to, um, okay, screen sharing. Um, I can also share my screen briefly. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to start. I'd like to start with this example from a place called the Ile de Jean Charles. Uh, half a century ago, it was 35 square miles of farmland and a vast community uh, or small community, uh, but one nonetheless, an important one. And now it's less than one square mile with less than 10 inhabitants. And if you're on the, uh, if, if you're able to access the chat, you can click and see examples and photos of, of what this looks like. Those of us in South Louisiana uh, see a lot of this water over the road, as I imagine many of you are starting to see more, more commonly. Another example is, uh, for example, Hurricane Ida sent a nine foot storm surge of Gulf water across our citrus orchards and across many much of the farmland in the South, uh, salinating the water and destroying the food. And so I, I, that's the, the, the case I'm really sharing at the moment. But let me get to my question. My question is, how can 1-800-CYBERNET help steer through the inevitable difficulties of ecological degradation and dissolution uh, that are being posed? Mac, thank you for calling in with this question. So let me explain that at 1-800-CYBERNET, we're attempting to always be expanding the conversation so that we are ever including new perspectives and outlooks to frame and navigate such wicked problems as the one you've offered us today. I'd like to call upon my colleague, Fred Steyer, who may be interested in your problem and will be informed about who else to include in this conversation. Fred, can I patch the call over to you? Could you? Respond to Mac. Thanks, Kate and Mac. What a wonderful <clears throat> question. And it's clearly something that you have a very deep interest in. Um, keeping to our 1 800 cybernet <laughs> guidelines, uh, we have many questions that we help, we think will also help guide you. Um, and one resting on the idea that we believe strongly in a participatory universe um, would be where do you see yourself in the system? But another one that we think will also help is how do others that you see as integral to the system, where do they see you in the system? Is that the same as where you see yourself? Just as a way of getting started. Thank you for situating me within the system. Uh, I'm, I, I research the local food system. So the image about the, um, of the citrus trees and, and the destruction of, of local farms is of a particular interest to me personally. The other aspect as a public health practitioner, I'm interested in ways that communities can be more sustainable, especially as it relates to their own food. So with uh, the inevitable, the inevitability of ecological degradation, uh, what does that mean for our communities and their ability to, to eat healthy food? Okay, and um, thanks. I mean, I'm still interested in where you see others seeing you in the system too. But one of our colleagues here, who's also highly invested in areas of health and climate change, uh, Eve Pinsker, might be able to help with more questions. Yeah, well, among the questions that come to mind, um, Mac, are what uh, conversations have already taken place um, that you, you may know about um, among, you know, the people you mentioned, there's 10 people still hanging on at Lake Charles, others that have moved off. Um, what, what kinds of conversations have taken place 
um, both in that community and between them um, and governmental authorities on um, what's what's happening and what the options are for responding to it. Sure, and it's um, interesting you 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 said Lake Charles as opposed to Ile de Jean Charles because oh, yeah, Lake right. Charles Lake Charles is another coastal community coastal. that was yeah. hit by two consecutive hurricanes in 2020 during the height of COVID. Mm -hmm. And I just saw a news release this morning that they are still not getting a response from the federal government all these years later that is appropriate. And they're struggling to feed themselves. Um, it is difficult to get food there. Uh, with regards to conversations, there have been, for example, in the Ile de Jean Charles settlements, settlement uh, or, or resettlement conversations between the National Science, National Academy of Sciences, I believe, as well as the state government of Louisiana. And uh, it has not gone well. And to learn from this, uh, it uh, is daunting. It is, well, well that, well, the Ilda Jean Charles settlement is not my direct problem. I don't have a direct relationship to that. Uh, it's a bigger problem in that there will be over 13 million people expected to resettle from coastal communities in the coming decades. And if this small community is going, like this poorly, what does that say about what's what's to come for those 13 million people? One, one thing in my own experience that I've heard about that kind of resonates with this, I, I, I heard a discussion after Katrina um, about how communities within um, New Orleans responded or, or didn't respond um, to Katrina. And there was an example given of a Vietnamese pastor who was very successful in helping the people in his church relocate. Um, they, you know, had a network that existed outside of um, New Orleans, uh, you know, relatives elsewhere uh, in other states. And, um, and the, most of the community members did, you, you know, relocate um, during Katrina and were part of this sort of, uh, you know, helping network that existed outside of New Orleans. And um, so that's one of the things that made me wonder about, you know, what was going on with the Ile de, Ile de Jean Charles and, you know, what's happened to the people um, outside of, uh, who are currently living you know, outside of Ile de Jean Charles and, you know, again, the conver whatever conversations are taking place between them and the people that are hanging on there, um, as well as, you know, as you were talking about between them and, um, you, you know, what other, other, other forms have been set up to discuss the situation that, you know, involve um, national as well as local authorities. Um, as far as questions, I guess, you know, one question that that connects to is, is that relationship between conversation and how people are talking about what's happening to them and what their options are and, and, and what anthropologists call social organization or social networks. One thing that I want to jump in with uh, following you, Eve, it may be valuable here to think about um, in keeping with this idea of our roles in various communities. So Mac, your, your role in that community, your relationship to the communities you are um, talking about, how we speak with different people, the kind of language that we use. I wonder if my colleague, Larry Richards might be able to speak to this um, Larry, could you perhaps add something about the kind of language that we won't use with different communities and the way we use language in relationship to our responsibilities and our roles? <laughs> yeah, probably not. Uh, it, it does occur to me that, uh, Mac, uh, with your research that you're doing, that you have an opportunity to present some models uh, uh, for other places. Um, 
because this I, this resettlement uh, is going to be an issue throughout the world, and certainly it's going to affect all of us eventually. Uh, and part of that is, in fact, the language we use to talk about the problem and about possible models uh, for addressing it. I, one other uh, thought occurs to me, and that is that part of what makes this a wicked problem, speaking of language, <laughs> and, and, uh, is that there are, sounds like there are many, many, many stakeholders in this. And that uh, those stakeholders have different interests in the, in, in the approaches taken and that those interests don't necessarily overlap. Uh, uh, and that's gonna happen elsewhere as well. So I don't, I, I don't know enough about your research to know, you know what direction it's going, uh, but I certainly would be interested. So if I, can, yeah. if I can jump in on this and add to what Larry says, um, it sounds, Mac, like not only are people confronting core values, but they're also faced with changing them. And sometimes discursive, persuasive conversation has definite limits. And one thing I've mm -hmm. seen explored in this kind of situation is a kind of extension of what we're doing here in the salon, but it, building it up to the level of a festival where we would have artists and scientists and designers and technologists and community members uh, in dialogue, but dialogue mediated by works. And it could be artistic works. It could be scientific presentations created in game formats, a whole panoply of presentations and all of those leading to further dialogue, but dialogue that is grounded in what is presented in the works and also the reflection and empathy that flows out of those. Yeah. Well, if I can offer an alternative or supplement to that, um, think of what's already going on as a performance. Uh, the the people, for instance, that are hanging on there at, at um, in Ile de Jean Charles, um, they're enacting their own vision of of their values and what they want to to literally hold on to, um, and you know the interaction between the performance and what people are saying about it and the different conversations that are going on, you know, does become a metalog. Right, it's people are enacting what they want and what they're reaching for at the same time that they're talking about it, um, and and in the dance of you know multiple choices and multiple conversations, it, you know will emerge. I think the, the future will emerge from that, um, and but art, you know, self conscious art does provide a potential context for people to you know, go meta, right? And to comment on, on what's going on. So then you know, that adds a potential other, other you know, layer to this mix. And I think you know, one source of wisdom about this sort of thing is um, so my colleague, Michael Lieber, um, back in the 70s edited a collection on exiles and migrants in Oceania that came out of earlier work that was done um, and, and was funded around uh, relocated communities in the Pacific. Uh, and at the time, you know, we weren't thinking about climate migration, but that's going to happen and it is happening already in the Pacific. But even before, you know, climate change was the reason um, the communities there were going through this complex dance of both enacting um, relocation, enacting what community meant to them, what the connection to original homelands versus new places meant to them, um, and and the you know what was written about that at the time, I think can be very instructive as we're moving forward. You know, Mac, we had an interesting email exchange among the 
um, call agents of 1-800-CYBERNET last week. And it was about considering um, one of the call agents, Claudia Westerman, who's on the call today, um, was spoke about considering the desires of peoples in these various communities and the ways that they desire to live and desire to be on the planet and the spaces they desire to inhabit. And uh, I mentioned something about the kinds of sounds that they desire to hear and are used to hearing. And so that may be an interesting question we want to um, bring up also. How do we hold conversations with people so that we can determine their desires and that they feel comfortable in expressing those desires. And Eve, you had mentioned during this conversation that we need to have, be sure, be adamant about having conversations so that we under, so with the people in these communities so that we understand those things. And, and enter into, you know, we're inside the box too, like we were saying, right? Enter into the conversations that are already going on. Um, and one of the things, though, I think that happens when you have, you know, multiple perspectives involved in conversation is that people begin to become aware of, of assumptions that they held that they weren't aware of before. So when you're talking about the relationship of people to the land and to the places they inhabit, um, you know, most of us have a lot that we take for granted that, um, you know, uh, I mean, Bateson and Mead, as anthropologists, talked about um, this as, as um, well, Bateson said, epistemological premises, um, but, you know, Mead called it culture. But a lot of this is, you know, isn't always part of our conscious awareness. Um, and then when catastrophic events like your land being flooded, you know, force us to become more aware of you know, for instance, our relationship to the places that we inhabit and what they mean to us. Can I interject a little bit from the meta view? There's a question in the chat from Brett. What role should geoengineering play in these wicked problems versus other solution spaces? So you have geoengineering mm -hmm. and what other scope might there be? It's a specific question about geoengineering. Any thoughts on that? Well, and that relates to the earlier comment in the chat box about about um, polders and the kind of geoengineering that's gone on in in the Netherlands. Mm, yes, I'd like to say a few things about the geoengineering that has taken place because I, I saw that also. <laughs> New Orleans works uh, very closely and has ever since Hurricane Katrina with the uh, with the Netherlands and the the levy systems that we're always learning from each other. Our mayors go there back and forth. I think New Orleans right now has possibly one of the best levy systems in on the planet, and it's the best um, that it has ever been at, at present. Uh, the thing about um, the thing about uh, the coast is that it's not on bedrock, so the levy system sinks every day and it gets lower. And so that's one of the issues of the geoengineering. The second one is that um, the bowl that we are in called New Orleans uh, is every day having water pumped out of it. So we also have subsidence within the city. So it's not we're not just facing rising sea levels. We're also facing sinking land because of the pump and drain mechanisms. So um, there's a lot of uh, it's a very the geoengineering is very complicated. Our levy system at present in New Orleans is expected to last until 2050, 2060 before it needs constant and very expensive revision. And just to talk about the storms we face Hurricane Ida last year had sustained winds of over of at 150 miles per hour, uh, which is frankly terrifying. Um, and uh, the storm surge was only nine feet, but for example, Hurricane Katrina, the storm surge was 20 feet. So you end up seeing things like alligators and coffins and <laughs> all things that shouldn't be in trees and trees after these storms. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's not, um, and, and and they're getting worse and more frequent. So the, there's also kind of that that aspect to geoengineering for what maybe. So Mac, um, this is Fred. You know, I was the first. 
uh, after Kate, the first 1-800-CYBERNET person you spoke to. And one of the things that it strikes me is that you're telling a lot more of the story behind this as questions are being brought forth. But even though we're a free service, we also like to learn about ourselves uh, with your questions. And I wonder if you might offer some reflection on our own, pro have our questions, for example, on our own process, have our questions been contradictory to you? Have they opened up new spaces for thinking about the situation, which is such a critical situation right now? Yes, I think one of the things that uh, I observe in questions is um, the maybe the the lack of understanding of the question act, asker sometimes of the inevitability and gravity of the impermanence of our coastlines. Um, mm. And the second thing that has has helped me a lot in my own thinking is there are lots of problems and this problem of resettling outside of the levee protection system is not my direct problem right now but it has a chain of it has a chain reaction effect right so it's when when the land east of us or west of us when hurricane ida hit last year when that happened it created massive problems for months for um even though for, for us even accessing food and grocery stores here in New Orleans, but it also drives housing prices up as people come in from these from these other communities. So the problems are, are complex and many and they kind of domino effect. For me, what's been helpful as a researcher is to focus my situation of interest, which is in particular food systems and help to tease it out from you know the, the first the first layer of the of, of, of the chain chain effect versus maybe the setup. Does that make sense? Yes, and I'm thinking that we should invite you to become part of our 1-800-CYBERNET team in the future. Thank you. <laughs> that might be a beautiful moment to, to begin to close. Kate, did you have a comment? Sorry. No, please go ahead, Paul. So I think in, in the tradition of bringing the first hour of the speaker series to a close, we'd like to thank all of the participants and especially the, the viewers who have come and have listened and now there's an opportunity in just a minute for you to become participants as well. But before we do that in the chat, I'll put a broader reference to the New Macy Studios uh, proposals, actually the page I showed earlier, which I just didn't go into detail for the many studios and also some more general documentation for New Macy to invite you to RSD, for example, in October. But we don't wanna lose you. We want to entice you to stay and now become further participants in what we're about to do, you hear the constant theme of emergence and improvisation and evolution. Uh, and uh, we'd like to ask Claudia now to uh, transition us to a fully interactive session, and we hope you can all stay for the remaining half hour. Claudia, can I give it to you? There we go. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. So after this um, wonderful 1-800-CYBERNET uh, chat. Um, I would like to introduce our mural board for, um, for poetic improvisations, where you could now uh, respond or add questions, respond, improvise, um, your in relation to the theme or maybe a new theme about um, what you thought just at the moment. And let me just try to share this one moment because it's just... Um... Would you like to share oh. screen, Claudia, or would you rather have me do that? No, I, I can, but um, it's, I, I'm in this weird loop of sometimes it happens that. So here's the, the right. board. And I, I think someone can just uh, maybe paste a link into the chat. Um, yes. What you see here are a number of boards, but the one that's really interesting is this, which is called frame two. And what you can do is we would like to really collect 
collect we would like to collect uh, this was not meant to be like this okay we would like to collect your contributions and what you can do is you double click in here and then when you type when you type the text will get smaller and smaller so you could could add actually um, a whole half a book or something. Um, so I think we have around 15 minutes for this. Yes. And if you have problems to connect to the Miro board, then let us know. We will, we will try to assist. If there are any questions, then please type them into the chat. And then after the 15 minutes, we are going to have a quick look at what you have contributed. I'm, I'm also going to monitor it here a little bit. So um, maybe while we're doing this. And... and feel free to continue the exchanges that have started in the uh, Zoom yeah. chat. And uh, we can pull some yes. comments there as well. So maybe I I just keep the share on so we see what's going on for those who do not want to connect to the new real board. I also see some chat here. You see there are a number of interesting comments. Some also relate to our process. Could we boil it down? Our Zoom chat and the 1-800 cybernet discussion could we boil it down to how we how do we thrive as humans as lively human in the universe that may reject our hmm. something missing still Maybe at this point, I can also add for those who are interested there, there are quite, um, there are materials online about the um, Jean Charles community. And there has been, there have been some new documents released just last week, I think, or 10 days ago, which are quite interesting in terms of how communication, communication has apparently gone wrong. Um, so for those who are interested, there should be a lot of material online, actually.
Do we have a case study? Has New Macy solved any problem? And we no. only ask more questions. <laughs> no. By definition, these problems are not solvable. But that I don't mean that to be a deflection. This is where we wish to go with New Macy to move from conversation to action. And maybe support the problems mutating. Yes. 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 I mean, because one thing that struck me that we should explore, like with Max's problem and what he started raising, was so, you know, what's the connection between um, the conditions that are um, supporting relocation or, you know, causing people to have to consider relocation? And what's the connection? you know, connection between that and the food system. Mm. 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 Yeah, it was quite interesting that apparently the community had them, they, the community had proposed a particular place where they could imagine to move to. And, but now, the, the the place alone what wa wasn't the solution yeah, and that's uh, yeah or at least not the way other people imagine the place right yes. and yeah. and then so part of the question is who's imagining the place and then and what's the place and and, and who's imagining you know also the connection between food and the place right yeah yeah so i i live across the street from a community garden um, that was created in response to uh, the felt need for um, refugees from rural areas who are here in Chicago to have a place to grow what they wanted to eat. And um, so the thing has evolved um, in the context really of a conversation between, uh, you know, people that have helped assemble the resources for the garden and the people that are gardening and and growing and 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 those of us others of us who are eating the food. So, um, but yeah. but yeah. So it's you know again it's part of a conversation. Here's an interesting comment that communities have more ways to act when they are not yet in crisis, and I think that's mm -hmm. a good point. That is part of why we want to speak about these problems now. I mean, Ile de Jean Charles is already in crisis, but many other communities will be. So what can be done now for those communities? That would be interesting. Yeah. If there are really more uh, ways to act now. Well, on the other hand, sometimes you don't make radical change unless you are in crisis. Hmm. Let's maybe move over here. Well, here's an interesting one that would be uh, mm -hmm. how important is it to be human centric in seeking or exploring solutions to wicked problems? Is it a stance we can relinquish? What would we gain? Mm -hmm. I mean, from a second order perspective, there's never a way to give up our point of view because it's just the way we look. We cannot move outside of ourselves. So I suppose we just have to admit that whenever we look, we are human centric. Our view is going to be human centric, but we can expand, I guess. Oh, I think definitely we can expand. And, you know, when you look at, for instance, at indigenous knowledge and the ways that, uh, you know, that indigenous cultures have talk about um, the species that, you know, share the planet with us. Um, you know, in a different way than 
you know, we in the European West traditionally do. Um, I think, you know, there are ways of opening ourselves to, to the, the sentient beings that, that live with us and that we live with and, and to pay more attention and a different kind of attention um, to uh, ourselves as only one of many species on the planet. Yeah. How do we work to ensure that climate change refugees don't, do not become permanent refugees as a result of losing their homes and needing to resettle rapidly? Mm -hmm. I suppose here conversation would apply again and we can maybe move over some uh, here conversation. I think correctly pointed out that the syllable con means with and now the little thing disappeared. Maybe we can find it again. There's an interesting concurrent conversation happening in the chat as well. Yeah, I don't see the chat at the moment as I'm right here. <laughs> 17 new messages. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, Fred, since you're involved in that chat conversation, maybe you could quickly summarize or um, <laughs> point out some important questions. Yeah, well, there are many, uh, the, yeah. I would say what's interesting is that there are multiple conversations going on. Mm -hmm. right? um, I don't know that what's going on in the chat is any more important than what's happening in the neural board. Yeah. But I mean, one of the things that that was pointed out that is something I responded to is that in the mirror board, we don't know the author of the post-it notes. Mm -hmm. And so is that helpful or does that, I mean, sometimes it's helpful to not know who the author is because you don't make assumptions about what the intent is, but it also helps in understanding it. So it's kind of, that, that's just one of the things that's going on. But Dylan also had several mm -hmm very interesting observations that she may want to come to speak to in terms of the language that we're using and how we're using the term solving, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, which connects to control, right? And what Mac was saying about, you know, not being able to control the coastline. Uh, Pile, if you want to come back in, just interrupt me uh, based on the cue that you were just given. But what was just said also refers to Andy Pickering's work, who's been moving more into the ecological realm uh, after his quite extraordinary, in my view, book uh, on the cybernetic brain and his prior work in Mangalore practice. Uh, he's asking questions in the Colorado River case, for example what can you do? And on the doing of that, what is the answer that you get back from the ecology? And how do you work toward this conversation with nature? His general rubric, I think now is called acting with nature. Yes, thanks for focusing on it, uh, Claudia. Um, anyway, his current writing is in that direction. And the uh, action research that started with Kurt Lewin, probably, right? Uh, it's a nice reference point. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you, Deborah. I think from a, a, a resilience perspective and, and a panarchy perspective, it, it, when looking at the axes on, on like the, the Y axis, um, sometimes on the panarchy is, is labeled as resources and taming nature for a, a dam of the Colorado River or the routing of water or to protect the city of New Orleans was, was more feasible with resources in the past, but when it's Miami, the Gulf Coast, the, the, when, when, the, 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 when the, the number of, of places that are in crisis 
need a level of resources that is so much uh, it, it becomes not just financial but but human um, capacity. The, the the resource kind of through a resource perspective uh, or orientation is is not working. I if I may jump, and... sorry, uh, if I may yeah. jump in here really quickly, I also think that our initial attempts to do that were not very human centric, and we ignored a lot of people when initially doing that that work. So I think that is also something to consider. Yeah, and it's it's still part of it. And I mentioned in the the John Charles that when the um, no, when the when the Corps of Engineers redid the Mississippi River in I believe the, the Great Works time, I believe the 30s to the 50s, they decided that the Ile de Jean Charles area of Louisiana was not cost effective to save. And that's still happening right now uh, with Plaquemines Parish, which is uh, east of New Orleans, where we where the river needs to needs a diversion and they need to let it outlet and build silt up where communities are already living to uh, create more of a natural barrier against the storms and the storm surge as they come in. And, and that's a decision that is made at the gover government level to uh, saying to a community, hey, we like the river needs to go where you currently live. And so it's just a constant tension that has been a historical tension and at present a, and at present it's a, it's, it's a current tension that's gonna continue to be one. Yeah, and as you said, for more places than New Orleans, too. Here's an interesting comment about um, the forms of communication. And uh, it, it seems to suggest that um, 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 there are communication forms to be invented. And if so, that we need to take care of how understandable these forms are to others. And I think it's probably not about inventing, but listening to the others and how they speak and then mediate the conversation in such a way and language that everyone can be integrated. but maybe someone else could speak to this. And if I may add to that, Claudia, the listening tools mm -hmm. that we might use, because I, I, I often feel that um, we might depend on a certain set of tools when we need to look for a broader range, a broader range of tools that might open up new possibilities. For example, we had the poetry that you were speaking earlier on in the, in the session, which opened up a whole new range of emotions and completely shifted the, the sense of the meeting. And likewise, then putting the, the board on that we're working on now, those added tools change that kind of construct of listening. And I think that's very powerful because often there's the need for the action, but that place of listening um, Glanville talks about that place of sensing and Paul as well in your writing that place of reading learning listening as a cycle I think is so crucial for how we might understand and reimagine where we are with the work that we're doing yes I think there might also be an interesting perspective for cybernetics with regard to characterizing nature uh, many of the comments speak about nature as if it were a given and a known, and also as if it characterized itself as nature, whereas I think it would be more cybernetically accurate to say we create a characterization of nature, and we do that speculatively and in an evolutionary manner. So I think that paying attention to how we're, how we're constructing 
an image or a characterization of nature could be very important in many of these questions because the old 19th century concept of nature certainly doesn't fit. And even within indigenous characterizations, people are part of nature, but they're a distinctive part and nature yeah, doesn't really. necessarily speak directly to us as nature. Well, and then there's the whole issue of control, right? That we've already brought up. Um, yeah. And and is, you know, and in our more like shared conventional way of thinking, you know, nature is something, well, you know, Adam like named all the species, right? <laughs> then, you know, nature is something that we're supposed to name and control. Exactly. I, uh, we should wrap up shortly, but I just want to, in line with this, I just want to draw everyone's attention to the article um, that you posted, Brett, um, about extraterrestrial life and the, the New York Times article, and just the, this idea, the, the possibility of considering that um, in terms of opening up our assumptions about what nature is, what communication is. So shifting away from the human centric, but also the planet planet centric, you know, or this planet centric. Um, so thanks Brad for posting that. So Claudia, um, I hate to stop our conversation, but maybe you could help us to wrap up this statement. And if you have any conclusions about the poetic responses we've produced or anything else. You've taken us through them. I, I, I would like to mention, so I just stopped the screen sharing, but um, I would like to mention that we keep the mirror board open. Everyone is invited to still add uh, comments and, and we will certainly be very happy to read them also. Uh, tomorrow, maybe, I mean, if you want to continue writing, please do so. Um, they will make for the next input in our next session, I would say. Um, I think it's very valuable to have these comments and ideas, the questions posed, the ideas about conversation and how important it is to think about language in the context of community and um, and yeah, how we speak, maybe, or develop conversations and how we expand from this very, the Anthropocene to something that takes a broader view that includes indigenous positions, other ways of seeing, approaching nature, maybe. So um, I'm, I think we will take these positions in, to our next session. And with this, I will hand over. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks for taking us through that. We have a couple of minutes only, if anyone would like to make some of their own comments here. Uh, we'll put some more information in the chat in a second about uh, the RSD and the continuation of this. Again, this hour was very compressed at RSD. Each studio will have its own 90 minute session. There'll be an introduction to the new Macy for the RSD people. There's an act one, which does a kind of setup similar to this. And then this individual studios, 90 minutes each, six studios over the course of a couple of days. And then the act three, of the RSD idea is to do what we've done here, which is to have a wrap up with a 1-800 cybernet, but to invite the audience in an, a truly improvisational one where we try to bring what we feel are valuable perspectives and language and concepts from the transdisciplinary uh, field of cybernetics to other problem spaces, so-called, to other uh, wicked situations, wicked challenges. But any any, any desire amongst the audience to make a general comment before we close? So I just want to jump in quickly, just but um, 
uh, not to interrupt any questions that may emerge, but just to say that uh, to remind everyone that the, the studios that we spoke about that will happen at the RSD conference in Brighton. So that's at one conference, but they will also happen throughout the year yes. um, and they will be becoming. So the studio that I'm involved in with TJ McLeish and Damian Chapman, we will hold a studio at the end of October. Um, there are other studios, uh, things are happening. There's an exhibition um, in Detroit, right, Mark, that um, Mark and Claudia and Eric um, have organized. Uh, it's actually in East Lansing. Oh, so sorry, Mark, in East Lansing. So um, there'll be information about all of these things on newmacy.org. So please, uh, we'll remind you again, but please always uh, feel free to visit that site. Um, and it's there in the chat. Um, and there'll be information updated all the time there. Well, I have to say, I'm delighted that you were willing to accept the invitation. And mm -hmm. I'm also delighted that it was all new in spite of having had something similar in your ISSS conference. And I'm sure the one in Brighton will be all new again because of its uh, compositional emergent nature. It just has to be. Thank you.